Okay, to start off, I'd like to get an idea. If you raise your hand, those of you who have taken a course in orthodox, in regular college, uh, micro or macroeconomics, would you raise your hands? Oh, that's good. Um, okay, because uh, how many here have read uh, Beyond Balbay? Just to get an idea of how much you've read in Austrian stuff. Certainly less. Okay. That's a good, uh, Okay, I, I propose to start with the first theme here is, is Crusoe economics, as Mary Lou said. Um, where um, one of the one of the reasons for this is that we the format. I'm trying to I'm, I'm new at this thing too. I'm not new in teaching economics, but new in this sort of format. So we're grouping our way here. But uh, to start with a uh, uh, to show the distinct one of the things that shows the distinctiveness of Austrian economics is the is the method by which it develops the the, the, system, the discipline. Um, and this is very different from other other economic schools. Uh, so we start off with with Crusoe. Robinson well, Crusoe was landed on this so-called desert island. It's not really a desert. I mean, if it was really desert, he probably would have died fairly quickly. It's an island with resources and so forth. And he has um, he has um, technological knowledge, quote unquote, of things to do. So uh, first point I think or theme is how the most of the economic concepts. Can be developed just by looking at Crusoe vis-à-vis -vis nature. In other words, the idea of this thing is to start off very simply with with, uh, with uh, one individual without bringing in other people yet, which makes it, of course, more complicated. One individual vis-à-vis -vis nature and what happens. So I don't know. I could give a spiel first and then have a discussion. I'd rather sort of get a feel now what uh, what any of you think. Start the discussion off. What concepts can be approached through this kind of method? You start off with Kuso, he's there, it's day one, he's been shipwrecked, he's standing there on this island, and now what? Okay. Okay. Can we start with more on this? Words? What do you think, what concepts do you think can be developed? What economic concepts? I think he's rapidly going to come to the conclusion if he sits there waiting for the welfare state to look after it, he's right. not going to get very fast. That's for sure. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Anything more um, <laughs> concrete? He's going to get off his ass and start right. working. Exactly. How is it In other words, he's got certain goals he's got to achieve, right? Pretty fast, obviously, in this situation. He's going to arrange them in hierarchical structure. What's right. most important immediately? Right. His priorities. Okay. Food first. Right. Food first. <laughs> Presumably shelter next. Because you start with Maybe pieces. water first, eh? Water. Yeah, water. Water. <laughs> island. He's got to find some fresh right. water. Kill that. Water first, yes. Then food. Then shelter. Yeah. He, uh, he owns everything, presumably. He doesn't have to worry about the fact that other people name Yeah, there's no other people yet. I know, well, see, that we get, that's a little bit later on, the question of what, what ownership is. What do you mean by ownership? So it's, it's all there available for you. So let's uh, you let's know. postpone that until we get to Friday. Friday makes his, his or her and really, really, even if he doesn't own the island, even if he knows, to begin with, the island is wholly owned by somebody else, he would act the same way. Because he yeah. would well, like to support it. A lot of this is also an unknown island. Un un yeah, it's what it's important to make that. I should point that out. Okay, so he's got the. Uh, <laughs> 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 okay. Right, he just arrived. Nobody's found him. Nobody's found him big enough. All right. Okay, so he's got, he's got certain priorities, as Lisa said. Okay, he's got to arrange them in some way. And uh, one of the things, or one of the concepts in. Uh, now, many, most schools have this, most uh, so-called orthodox or mainstream, what I call orthodox economics, has this, but it's, very, it's kind of differently organized, as we'll see later. Uh, so he's got priority, okay, he's got, he's got choices. Yeah. Yeah. Water, food, shelter. Now, these are not, this part's not broken down. He's got I mean, food, pretty much. As you, as you go along, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Swiss Family Robinson, which is sort of like this. You, a, family, a Swiss family named Robinson gets on there, and they, and they start like this, and after a year or two, they got a whole big thing going, like boardwalks and gardens and you know, that sort of stuff. So as you go along, as you get more affluent, your food your food requirements become more specialized, right? Then you look for Wheaties or whatever and stuff. <laughs> so, but Kusov is only starting off doesn't have this problem, okay? And then and they're closed. Right, whatever. So you've got you've got this. Uh, let's call it economics a value scale. Okay, a scale of, of goals or ends or purposes. Now, one of the things, by the way, this is sort of interesting. Is the when I was first, I teach at a place called Polytech Institute in New York, or used to be called Brooklyn Poly. And when I 
I first came out of the department, I had a social science department, they knew I was great, I had these crazy ideas, literally in posts at laissez-faire and so forth and so on. This is a department of half Marxists and half liberals. So they had me give a lecture, and, and I started off with goals and ends and means and sort of stuff, so the basic axioms of Austrian economics, and they fought this bitterly step by step. They refused to admit that people had goals, for example. <laughs> uh, yeah, because they, I think even though in their daily, in their regular scholarly work, much less their daily life, they realize that people have goals and they act on them and so forth and so on, but they were scared stiff that they've conceded one point oh, yeah. that they have to line up and lay their <laughs> <laughs> Which logically they have. That's right. <laughs> they sort of sense this, right? <laughs> So it's really weird hard to sit there for an hour and a half and argue about people have motors or goals or not. Anyway, that's... Okay, so they've got, they've got, they've got goals. And first, by saying this, you're also assuming that people uh, have goals, they have choices, they can do something about it, uh, which is the Austrian concept of action. Okay, so the whole concept of action comes right in here, that people act. And, they, and in order to act, you have to have goals or purposes or ends in mind. Okay, so that's... It's wrapped up in the concept of action. And priorities and value scales or preference scales from goals. Right? So this is and one of the one of the things that will go along here is that one of the problems which cause confusion in economics is linguistic or semantic, with the, the sort of words that are used of have historical reasons for it. In other words, people start, for example, economics began I think well, it didn't really begin, but Systematically began in 19th century, early 19th century England was agricultural. So a lot of the, the words are, semant- are, are agricultural based, agriculturally based, which we have a different language now, so it's, it's a little difficult. We'll, we'll see if we go along. For various reasons, this value scale, preference scale, you know, is called you know, economics utility. Okay. So already, this already causes confusion because most people, when you think of utility, think of something which is useful. And it's not this, this, is, not, this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about Subject of valuation is the part of Crusoe's case. Right? So, in the value scale, or in the utility scale, you see the confusion that can come in when uh, critics of the market, for example, people like Galbraith or whatever, well, Galbraith by the way, lay at your door here in this country. Be <laughs> responsible for this joke. Anyway, <laughs> I, huh? I object. You object. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we got plenty of problems too. Okay. <laughs> but I, mean, I never bought his book out. Okay. Why read it? Is Galbraith can ask Galbraith or Galbraith up here? What is the? I hear both ways. Galbraith. I don't have to get really mad. Okay. <laughs> just, you know, it's not, it's not a vital point. At any rate, um, <coughs> so the, the people like him would say, well, these are not. There's certain goods and services which he likes are called, he would call useful in some kind of objective sense, right? There's other things which other people like are not useful. Uh, then you can have a quarrel about whether, for example, back in the 1950s when he got launched, uh, there were Cadillacs those days had tail fins, if you remember. And there's a big hysteria among people like the outbreak, other left liberals. Attacking tail fins as being evil, as being wasteful. I, never saw, I, I wasn't a great tail fin fan myself. I never saw anything wrong with them. <laughs> so the point, the point is that that utility then means doesn't mean in economics what somebody says is objectively useful, whatever that's supposed to mean. Uh, it means whatever people is useful to them, or what they would like to achieve, what goals they like. Whether other people call that wrong, irrational, uh, wasteful, whatever. In other words, uh, utility. And economics, uh, and certainly Austrian economics, has a subjective connotation. It's, it's, it's subjective valuation on the part of the, the uh, person, the actor, the individual, the consumer. <clears throat> okay, so uh, that doesn't mean there aren't such things objectively useful or not useful. The point is that from the point of looking at economics looks at it from the point of view of the individual actor. Um, so, all right, the. Um, this, by the way, was always a problem when working with Randians in Australian economics. Uh, Rand believing in ob- objective value. It's like, how can you have a sub- theory of subjective value? This is, it was a big, you know, big problem for Randians. And of course, the answer is we're not talking about, this is not an ethical course in ethics. Or economics is not this ethical discipline. If you're dealing with ethics, you can say something might be objectively good or bad, or useful or not useful. 
economics analyzes the individual actor as he or she acts. And so that the value is the valuation on the part of this, this person. In that sense, it's value-free and right. being objective yeah. value. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Right. Right. So it's, uh, it's value-free on the part of the economist in the sense that we're not imposing our values on the individuals. Okay. So let's try to analyze the situation. Um, Another thing about Austrian economics, which is, I think, unique, is that uh, what we're doing here is we're taking certain common sense facts, such as people act, people have goals and purposes, and basing an economic discipline on that formal fact without going to the question of what what, he's, what his purposes are. In case of Crusoe, we're talking about food and shelter, et cetera. But basically, we don't really care what the purposes of the individual are. The fact that he has certain purposes and goals to achieve, that's all we need for the discipline. So we're not interested in economics, what he should be valuing, as I said, or you know, whether he's a nut for doing it or something. That's not whether he should be, whether he should be eating butter or cornflakes or something. That's, that's, that's another discipline, aesthetics, ethics, whatever you want to call it. So that's, that's the, one of the things which one confusion which come in. <clears throat> OK, so we have, uh, we're just really beginning with this. Proves that we have a value scale here. And we have action, concept of action. Um, Anything else anybody can see is a concept that applied in action. Right? Uh, Rousseau. Okay, he's got, what has he got? He's got to try to keep away from the actual content, like, you know, I mean, you always have that example of like he shoots deep and gets a bow and arrow or something, or catches fish with a net. Basically, the idea is what, what sort of thing, what sort of concepts come in here? Um, what has he got? He's got his own person. Okay? He's got himself. And he's got, Okay, he's, got his, he's only going to achieve his goals by his own person. No, nobody else there. He's going to be doing it. He's got, he's got personal energy. Okay. And you've got technological knowledge. I mean, in a sense, they're combined, of course. But the point is, you can conceptually say you've got technological knowledge. Technological, of course, in this case, is not, is not high tech. I mean, computer programming is not going to do him a whole lot of good here. <laughs> it does not. Technological knowledge of how to catch fish, building a net, getting a bow and arrow, whittling a stick, and all that sort of stuff. This is not, this is low tech, but it's tech. Okay. <laughs> so we've got technological knowledge. And he's got natural resources. He looks around, sees what's going on. There's trees, there's berries, you can eat you know, strawberries, there's, there's fish, there's water and so forth. All these things are what na are, are nature given. Okay, so we've got nature given resources and natural resources. So we're already getting concepts, economic concepts are coming in here. Um, now again, in economics, for the way, again, the, the semantics are different. It's, it's, the language was set in the early 19th century, more or less. Personal energy is defined as an economics labor. Right? Now the problem here is the way, for example, and there's a big, there used to be a big discussion, a controversy in the history of the Jackson, Andrew Jackson period in the United States, the 1830s. Uh, were they, were the Jacksonians labor leaders? Were they, were they some, some sense uh, like the present? Were they early ancestors of the New Deal, or semi-Marxist or something? Uh, they said they were in favor of labor. They kept talking about labor all the time. Since Marx, most people think of labor or laborers as being industrial workers, assembly line types, you know, construction workers. Or whatever. Labor in the, 19, in the early 19th century, 18th century sense meant anybody who's, who uses personal energy in production, in the fine production yet. Anybody who transforms resources, what it means, into uh, using personal energy. So this in the modern world would mean not just industrial workers, but the president of General Motors along with the assembly worker. Anybody who's using personal energy in the production process as a laborer. So it's already, you see, the, the, the causes all sorts of problems if you're looking at current 20th century terminology and economics, which is, you know, which has something 19th century uh, concepts. Uh, natural resources is also a similar problem. Natural resources are defined in economics as land. And again, so there's, again, a difference here. One is the land includes water, rivers, uh, you know, fish where the fish are, includes offshore oil at this point. It doesn't just mean land in the sense that we're used to, you know, this body of stuff, soil and stuff. Uh, now it includes space, get something out of space. 
include radio frequencies and all that. All this is Miami nature given. Okay? So on the one hand, it includes much more than we common sense nowadays think of as land. On the other hand, it also doesn't include buildings, for example. This, not, this building is not considered land, technically. The building is man-made. So, so what would be considered uh, land would be the ground underneath the building. Okay? So that's... What about that's, cows and things? Would that be land? That's uh, wild, yeah, I think wild animals are land. Wild land, right. I think. Yeah. Of course, domestic harvest them. Yeah, domesticated would be like, would be something else, which I haven't, I haven't got to that yet. But something else is. Okay. As soon as man enters into the picture and transforms things, then you have something else. The land is always there, of course. You always have some ground to stand on. Okay. So land always enters into the picture, but there's also this other. Other thing. Uh, okay, another thing. Anything more discussion on this? I don't want to keep talking anymore, Thomas. It's a problem with that? Extra. Because I I would distinguish between unowned and owned natural resources, but I, I don't see the distinction between distinguishing between. Uh, an apple tree and the apples it bears and the piece of land that it grows on, really. I don't really see. No, that's the other section, yeah. I mean, I see certain reasons yeah. for distinguishing, but not in, in a general category. Really. Well, apple would be nature given. Not if it's growing, if it's a domestic orchard. No, no, right. 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 I don't quite see the No, at this stage, though, mm -hmm. the assumption is that the island is unowned. Yeah, and ownership doesn't come into the picture yeah, yet. So it's not we haven't even defined ownership. There's only one man on the world. That's right. That's one man. Yeah. Right, precisely. So uninhabited. So everything yeah. is there. Is the so right. everything it's physical it's on the yeah. island is land. It's land. land. And surrounding it. Yeah. And underneath it. Yeah, all that's there. Uh, the, other, the other question I have is, you haven't put a word opposite technical knowledge in or even service. I don't think so. I think we're sticking with that. Uh, <laughs> because I include that with, with labor. I mean, yeah. in the sense that the, the, uh, yeah. the old idea of labor was to the executives and so on are laborers too, uh, the inventors and so on, and the technical knowledge and the personal energy cannot really be distinguished and, and separated. And I, I think they're both labor. Uh, I mean, there aren't, they aren't from a Marxist point of view, I agree, but they should be. Um, I don't know. See, the problem is that there's the things about technological knowledge which are different from uh, other resources. Uh, once, once you get it, you don't lose it. Right? In other words, it's, it's I wouldn't say it's non-scarce, but the, once you it's it's it's, um, well, it's not the personal energy is consumed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's used, used up. up. It's used up. Got tired. That's true. Technical knowledge is technical not. Technical knowledge is once you got it. Yeah. Once, once the recipe is being created, right. it can be passed on. Recipe is another word for it. You know, Mises uses that. So that's, uh, right. So it's, 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 a, it's a little different. Uh, and conceptually, of course, technological knowledge is important. So, you know, it's growth of it and stuff like that. Um, so. Um, Okay, all I was thinking of is you think of these basic categories of economic resources, mm -hmm. and the one is land and the other is labor, mm -hmm. and so technical knowledge, if, if you're going to split it that way, it would have to go into the labor. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, nature doesn't have technological knowledge. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Represents something. So, anyway. Okay, another thing, of course, that he finds is this is, uh, is I, I like to start off my classes in microeconomics with uh, what I call the Garden of Eden model. The, uh, the Garden of Eden, either mythological or actual, uh, there was superabundance. There was no scarcity. The definition of the Garden of Eden is it was superabundant. If you, if, you, if you want to have a Pepsi trickling down your throat, you wish for it, you snap your fingers, and by God, there it is. Okay. That's the Garden of Eden. There are certain logical problems with the Garden of Eden model. Supposing what I wished for and what this gentleman wished for could clash. Okay. But aside from that, uh, by definition, everything is super abundant. If everything is super abundant, then there's, there's no problem with private or property ownership, as a matter of fact, no problem with price or scarcity or anything. There's no economics because if you want something, it's there. If you want, if you want a hi-fi set, it's there playing Bach, whatever you want. So that, uh, presumably, mankind was in the Garden of Eden in some sense originally and it was kicked out for various uh, sins and heresies. So what Crusoe faces, of course, is stark and what we all face. Uh, is the world of scarcity. You know, all things are scarce, all resources, all uh, goods and services, etc. 
And because they're scarce, they have you have to allocate, you have to have the value scale. Can't know this Cusa can't just say, okay, I want to fix a nice suit of clothes from Brooks Brothers, and I want to, you know, uh, fake the Alaska and so forth. Because he ain't gonna get it. I mean, so he has to do all sorts of stuff. Has to be he has to allocate his time, has to allocate his energy, has to allocate, uh, has to have priorities, do the first things first, and so forth and so on. So he's uh, so we live in a world of scarcity. <clears throat> Some, of course, we are we have less scarce. We are. Our scarcity is less than, say, Crusoe's, obviously. Crusoe's an extreme scarce problem. He dies tomorrow if he doesn't get food quickly. We're not in that bad shape, obviously, but we have, we still have a world of scarcity. If things weren't scarce, everything would be free. It would be like wishing for Pepsi and putting it in our throat. Now, for about the, there are intellectual fashions. I don't want to shock you people, but there are, there are an intellectual world or fashion is some, some, sort of like ladies' hemlines. Every five years, some new gimmick comes in, and everybody f- follows it. <coughs> And one of the uh, one of the few benefits of advanced age is you see all these things come and go. Same junk, you know, <laughs> comes back ten years later and it drops out. Or so, so about ten years ago, during the period of the New Left, for a couple of years there was a big there was a big hue and cry. Not so much among economists, among some uh, New Left economists, mostly among intellectuals, sociologists, uh, people of that ilk, English professors. Uh, that we now live in a post-scarcity age. All these things, all this economic stuff about prices and all that, it all was true until 1960, 1968. But now this is 1968, by God, we live in a post-scarcity age and everything is great. We don't need it. All this stuff is now obsolete. So I had a debate one time with a neo-Marxist professor uh, around that period. He was giving this whole line of chatter. By the way, the conclusion of it was always is you have to have socialism. Whatever the, whatever the problem is, okay? we live in a post scarcity age, therefore, there'd be total unemployment, and then we're going to have socialism, or something like that. It's kind of nonsense. But anyway, so he was telling me we now live in a post scarcity age, all these economic screws are obsolete. So I said, Look, Professor Averill, I guess his name was, if, if, uh, if we live in a post scarcity age, why don't you burn your salary check? You know, what's, what's the point of having an income? You know what his answer was? It was unbelievable. He said, Well, it's because I too am. And uh, brainwashed by the capitalist ethic, capitalist ethics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's rough. Uh, it's, yeah, it's really rough. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, uh, so the, <laughs> a few years later, a few years later, the same people were saying that the post scarcity thing drops out. The same people were saying all resources are dying. Like in five years, we won't have any resources. And therefore, we have to have social. <laughs> right? It's amazing. I mean, it's just. Uh, <laughs> well, he said he proved socialism will cure the, the post scarcity age. Right. Isn't that such a thing at the moment? Because right. it's sure it won't be an abundance of any kind of thing. Right, exactly. <laughs> it'll, it'll cure the excess of affluence. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, anyway, we live in a world of scarcity, and as, as, as I say, as the world progresses, we have less, less things are less scarce, but it's still there. Uh, the. Uh, Okay, so that, that comes in, obviously it comes in an old proof of action. In fact, action is really this, you need action because of scarcity, because you haven't achieved your goals yet. Um, okay, he's got, he looks around, he's got, uh, he's got uh, things to reach the goal. He's got natural resources, he's got personal knowledge, energy, and technological knowledge. And these are his resources, okay? or means, equal means to achieve the ends. Resources, means, for his, so, you know, it's another way of saying the same thing here. That he's got priorities, he's got goals, he has to, to achieve them, he has to use these resources and allocate them uh, in hopefully a proper, proper manner. Okay. Uh, another thing is that um, all this takes time, right? Action takes time. No such thing as acting in a timeless vacuum. So he's got to, each one of these things will take a different amount of time. He's got to figure out this thing in three hours, six hours, three days, two weeks. So time is another picture. I mean, one might think that <coughs> this is kind of self-evident, but <coughs> orthodox economics or mainstream economics, microeconomics, if you read textbooks, time washes out. They're living, everything is moving around a timeless universe. There's already a key distinction. There's only you know, half hour into this thing. Key distinction between Austrian, between Austrian economics and everybody else. Namely, we incorporate time into the, into the analysis. Uh, would, could you almost put time along with those other things on the mind? You have to resource this person or anything. Yeah, you have to allocate time. I, yeah, okay. It's, right. And the things move through time. Action takes place through time, of course. Right. But those, those aren't actions. Those yeah. are resources. You know, say time's a resource. Yeah, well. time's a resource. Yeah. And um, one, of the, one of the problems is, uh, that by the way, I don't 
to talk about Randian's, but one of the problems with Randian's theory, okay, which is totally tangential, is that Randian's tend to think as if time is unlimited. There's no, there's no problem with allocating time. And uh, that you, know, you do one career for 20 years, and you move on to another career for another 30 years, so on and so on. A certain, a certain, uh, a certain, as if time were sort of not a problem. Okay. Uh, Okay, the, you must be uh, getting more acutely aware of that than some of us, perhaps. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but there's always, I mean, time is always scarce. And that's the, that's the, the. Anyway, the, uh, okay, so there's, um, then there's also another, another factor which enters in, which again, this thing which is all strange for everybody else, namely, life is uncertain. Right? You, we know things are certain things are happening, we can predict certain things, but it's uncertain. We don't you know, Crusoe, you know, it might be a hurricane tomorrow with a whole, you know, stock of fish or something, strawberries gets wiped out. So, and <clears throat> we have uncertainty. So one of the things that, again, distinguishes the Austrian theory is the Austrians incorporate uncertainty into the picture, into the analysis at the very beginning. Life is uncertain. Things can change. We don't have perfect knowledge of the future. You know, some things, you know, some, this gives the, we now already have a deviations within the Austrian movement. Uh, some Austrians are now going too far, so edging into nihilism, <coughs> and say like Professor Lachman of South Africa, and uh, has gotten to the point of saying that uh, we can't know anything about the future. Uh, the future is sort of like a total blank wall. Say. We can't predict or forecast anything, which I think is uh, you know, around the bend. So that's, uh, but basically the, the, the Austrian view is that there's, that there's you know, there's no certainty in the future. We can know some things, we can predict some things, etc. Uh, in contrast, neoclassical economics or standard textbook economics, which is essentially ball raising at this point, so, Leon Wall, Swiss economist, uh, wrote in 1970s, 1880s, as far as mine. His famous work was, was published the same year as, I think, 1873 or something around there, in the early 1870s. In Lausanne, Switzerland, uh, neglected during his lifetime, I think properly so myself, <laughs> <laughs> uh, rediscovered by Pareto, who was a brilliant sociologist, a very interesting person anyway, Italian <coughs> Pareto. <coughs> And uh, which has now become standard, more or less standard microeconomics. And many will keep referring to this. And uh, the uh, one of the things which the Parisian and the Laurasians, one of their theories is that everybody's got perfect knowledge. Perfect knowledge of the present, perfect knowledge of everybody else, perfect knowledge of the future. There's no uncertainty. There's no time either, of course. If there's, oh, time in a sense drops out. Time becomes, let me put it this way, if you, Perfect knowledge, perfect certainty. I right, see. If you if you look at it this way, you might think this is all crackers, you know, bunkers. But this is the orthodox mainstream economics at this point. Perfect certainty. And if you live in a world, so what does this mean? It means a world without change. We know, or with all, or change can be perfectly forecast, which really means without change. Then time becomes something very different from what human beings are. Experience it. Time becomes an endless round of everybody doing the same things. Knowledge is frozen. It's like a freeze frame. Okay? Uh, if knowledge is frozen, of course, everybody gets perfect knowledge eventually because there's no change. So I think new enters the picture. Anyway, this is the world which the Moravians <coughs> depict. And um, this is why you have a little mathematics and the equations and the diagram because. If everything is, is there's no change, there's no uncertainty, there's a perfect knowledge, everybody's got perfect knowledge, then you can just crank it out. You know, there's, no, there's no action. Action really disappears in the Malraisian universe. We'll get to that, explain that a little later. So, this is a very different <coughs> kind of economics. Um, okay, uncertainty then means that. Each, each individual person, Pusto and everybody else, is an uncertainty bearer. He's got to meet uncertainty. And this function of meeting uncertainty, which we'll explain later on in much more detail, is called entrepreneurship. 
he, he, you know, he has, he knows his, his goals, he, he's more or less has good inventory of the resources, but now he's got to act on it, and by doing that, he's got to, he's got to forecast, hopefully correctly, he's got to meet conditions and try to, and try to achieve them. Uh, if he, he makes too many mistakes, he's dead. Okay. Or in our case, we make too many mistakes, we suffer monetary losses. Uh, <clears throat> so this is, um, this is the, the entrepreneur is the uncertainty bearer. <laughs> um, another thing about Crusoe <clears throat> is given the goal, given the goal, let's say his goal is getting you know, uh, a gallon of clean water. Given the goal, he wants to achieve the goal as rapidly as possible. Okay, by definition, it follows the definition of action. He's got a goal, he'd rather have a gallon of water now than, than wait two weeks. Okay. So, this immediately brings in the Austrian concept of time preference. Uh, a lot of hassle about time preference. <clears throat> and basically it means, I think properly understood, it's a extremely important concept of the uh, person, given the, the goal, the person prefers getting the goal now than getting it later. Otherwise it's not really a goal. Something, something else is intervening here. Uh, there's all sorts of disputes about that. If a characteristic one is something like this. It's now the, the winter. You go back to the, the pre-refrigerator age and people use ice, ice boxes. Uh, in the winter you don't need ice boxes, you don't need them very much. You really need them in the summer. Therefore, if, you're, if this is December, you prefer getting the ice in July than we're getting it now. So doesn't this contradict concept of time preference, the preferring something now to later. The answer is it doesn't contradict it because it's not the same problem. In other words, we're assuming, we're given the goal, we're given the good, the good, the thing itself, and the, and the, um, and the resource itself, the, the object that we're valuing, uh, we're assuming a homogeneous object. In other words, we're assuming it's the same, the same serviceability, the same usefulness. Otherwise, it's a different object. Uh, so that Ice in the summer becomes a different good, even though it's the same physical object, same cube. It's a different good in the summer as it is in the winter, performing different functions. It's much more important in the summer. It has nothing to do with time, just that the, it's hotter in the summer if you need ice more. So the answer to that is simply the two different products. Given the product, given the good, given the thing, the, given the equal usefulness, people prefer getting it now and getting it later. Um, Talk about good. Surely that's only true if the amount of labor to, to get it is, is the same. Oh, sh I mean, for example, if you've got a choice of either paying for something now uh -huh. or letting someone buy it for you free of charge right. tomorrow, oh, sure. you don't need it till the day after. Oh, sure. Then, you know. So I think labor, you know, it's oh, the yeah. total amount of resources used and time is oh, just a resource the same. I'm sure you're balancing the, the product, the end, and the goal, and the value scale with what you have to do to get it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. It's one of the keys. People prefer less labor extended. <laughs> 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 right. I want an easy life. Right. 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 Any other comments on this? Is I want to make this a monologue instead of the temptation. <laughs> All right. The um, a good, by the way, we haven't defined a good. It's important. It's always been used. The good is a thing, either a commodity or a service, either tangible or intangible, which consists of an entity which is valued by somebody, obviously, otherwise it's not a good, uh, either by Crusoe or by us or somebody. An entity with <coughs> consisting of n homogeneous units. This is relates to the ice problem. Let's see, the end can be anything from one up to you know, 100 million. The, the idea is that the units have to be homogeneous. In other words, they're the same. Okay. Uh, so if you have a certain a grade of paper clip, certain size paper clips, you have a box of you know, 50 paper clips. Each paper clip is a unit, or the box is a unit. The units can vary, okay. but the idea is that each each unit is homogeneous to the other units. Yeah. Well, doesn't your illustration about the ice cube contradict the, the 
the idea that anything could, could be cool to me. Yeah. You got a kilowatt hour of electricity at, at 3.30 in the afternoon on, on, a, on, a, on a cold winter day when everybody's mm -hmm. watching a football game. It's, it's quite a different thing from a kilowatt hour of electricity, say, at 2 a.m. in the morning uh, in the springtime. That's right. <clears throat> But it's never the same. I don't think it's ever the same. I don't think it's ever the same. I mean, that's the ice cube in July, any given ice cube. See, the, the thing is, it's up to the person. It's up to the subject. In the sense that the individual, here I am, I, got, you know, I don't care which block of ice. Let's say it's the same size, it's the same hour. You know, I'm buying ice, a block of ice. I don't care which block of ice I'm getting. It's homogeneous to me. It's physically homogeneous and it's homogeneous to me. But you can't tell, you see, as an outside observer, an economist or statistician, you can't really be sure that it's something genius, because each individ different individuals might have different valuations on them. That's the point. See, the, so one of the things about econ uh, Austrian economics is that it provides very, and one of the reasons why it's not popular among economists is it provides very little room for economists to do much. See. As well, economists can teach this, can explain the beauty of it. We can't really. We can't advise government for various reasons. We get down, but probably so don't already. <laughs> we can't advise businessmen either. We haven't got really any. There's no. There's very little job opportunities for Austrian economists, except except teaching, and writing, and whatever. Say. And so the the economist doesn't have that. The outside observer doesn't have that much of a role because you can't really say that. Let's take an example. And a neo -class, and classical economics is totally different. They say this is the objective unit, and therefore it's the same. Good. <clears throat> Let's take. I think John Stuart Mill had this as a famous classical economist as well as philosopher, lousy philosopher, not too hot a classical economist either. At any rate, he's a very bright guy, but totally screwed up. Uh, <laughs> Mill is looking at the market. He has a concept we call economic man, a very pernicious concept. And he's looking at the market, and he sees that we, according to the economic analysis, ten, goods tend to have the same price. We haven't gotten the price yet, but it's pretty clear now that uh, if you have a block of ice, you know, somebody's two people, you know, three or four ice dealers in the same block, let's say, the prices will tend to be about equal because if, Joe's, if Zeke over here is selling ice for, you know, whatever, $50 a pound, I don't know how you sell ice anymore, $50 a cube. <laughs> if somebody else is selling it for $30 a cube, the guy, you know, Zeke is not going to last very long. Okay? I mean, some, <laughs> he's going to have to lower the price in order to stay in business. So, uh, so Mill is observing the, the world and he's saying, well, uh, there are situations where the, they have different prices for the same good continue almost permanently. Therefore, it's irrational. Therefore, these people are non-economic men. They're, they're, they're wrong. They're whatever. You mean they're just not following these ideas? Well, yeah. They're, they're, and the point of what he, he, he was looking at the physical object rather than the subjective evaluation of the individual consumers. To many of these consumers, they're different. the same thing might be a different good, or the different good thing might even be the same good. And, for example, the first... Um, well, there's extensions, too. I mean, the one ice has to charge more money might give a premium delivery service, and the other exactly. you have to pick it up. Exactly. The, whole, the, the, the good is all those exactly. things together. Precisely. That's a, another big Austrian insight. When you're buying something, you're not just buying a physical object, you're buying the whole package, the ambiance, whether the guy is friendly or not, whether the service, whether he gives credit, the whole bunch of stuff which is involved, which most... People want to look at. Uh, for example, uh, New York, they have a very posh uh, restaurant, the Blue Tess, probably the poshest of the country, uh, and they sell ice cream. Let's, say. let's, say they sell, let's assume that it probably it's not the same ice cream. Let's assume for a minute it's the same ice cream as uh, you know, McDonald's or Briars or something, a like fast food store. And yet, you know, the Tess will charge you know, 10 times as much as McDonald's for the same ice cream. And the reason is you're not just buying the ice cream, you're buying the whole ambiance, you're buying the servile waiter, you're buying the expectation of maybe seeing Jackie Onassis at the next table and stuff like that. But you don't get it at the McDonald's. You're also getting a more comfortable chair, that's like your Exactly, somebody. precisely. You're buying the whole pack of old Right. Precisely. In that case, though, the good is the ice cream, period. That's the only thing that can be defined as a good. No, no, good is not. In this case, good is the whole package. The reason why it's a different price. And it stays at a different price because you're buying the ice cream plus the whole service, the whole ambiance. The whole good. Yeah. So he's totally saying like that. It's not a homogeneous good. In other words, the ice cream, even though it might be the same physical ice cream, it's simply not comparable to what's in the right. McDonald's at all. Oh, Don't you say apples and oranges? Yeah. I'm just trying to understand this. Yeah. The, um, ice cream is a good. <coughs> 
when you add all of these other things to where you buy your ice cream, that's also a good, but it's not the same good as just ice cream. Yeah, it's the ice cream is the, it's the whole package. You're buying, I mean, you don't buy the pure ice cream. Well, that's it, I guess. You're buying, I mean, you never do. Yeah, you never do. Ice cream is never good right. in the sense. It's because not you're good. always buying a package. It's more convenient to assume it's the same good if everything else washes out. But then why, I mean, how can this definition have any meaning at all then? Because that's always the case. No, it's always the case. Well, in fact, we're going back to what you were saying about ice cubes. I mean, yeah. the ice cube in winter is not a lot of value to you because all you do is put your milk outside the outside the, on, the, yeah. on the on the branch right. instead. But, but in summer you can't do that. So well, that's the really utility for ice cream. Well, that's well, what you can't do. But ice cream is the same for ice. That's not my. It is that's exactly not my the point. same analogous in this situation. No, I don't have any difficulty understanding how we why things have different values. I'm trying to understand the definition of good because that's used all the time. Yeah. This implies when you say an entity consisting of n homogeneous units, right. that's supposed to imply that goods are the same in the market, right? Right. You have ice and it's ice. Right. Period. Yeah. Uh, but right. when you might say that those glasses of water tomorrow when nobody's here yeah. is a different good. Yes. But right now there's seven units of homogeneous supply yeah. Yeah. right but there. These six glasses, That's I don't care which glasses I pick seven up. Units. Yeah, these are homogeneous to me at least. Right. If, if you, if you really want to nitpick, yeah. uh, this is, there's a degree yeah. here beyond which, because even the glass that you've got your hand on is closer mm. to you and it is slightly better yeah. for you than the other one that's further away. Right. It seems but, so that there, right. there's never, what I'm saying is because they are physically identifiable units, they're never exactly the same. The thing is, it's so like plus. Thing is, also, yeah, in life, you, you, it washes out. You don't really care about whether yeah. it's two inches or six yeah. inches. Right. It's up to the individual again whether he cares or doesn't care. That's, that's yeah. the point. So. Okay. So, I mean, in other words, if you have 5,000 paper clips all the same size in a bowl, you know, I don't care whether which paper clip that is. Paper clips are homogeneous, and most people would be homogeneous. Somebody else, however, could be in some of not their own section or something. Not somebody who loves this paper clip because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Going back all to the ice cream, ice cream for all these yeah. the restaurants. Yeah. Yeah. All the ice cream at the restaurant is one good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. That's what I, was going to say. I understand that. I'm yeah. trying to understand the definition of good as it's going to relate to our discussion about economics. Because yeah. in other forms of economics, assume that ice cream is ice cream, mm -hmm. and so it should have the same value everywhere mm -hmm. to every person, mm -hmm. correct? Whereas Austrians Jeff recognize that price. a good in a given transaction is completely different no, than, could, than no, no, not completely. It could be. Can be, can based be. on the value judgment. See, the point is that, yeah, see, the point is that the, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're diminishing the role of the outside economist, the observer, who's trying to figure out what's going on. You're less able to figure out what's going on. They want to manipulate the situation. Um, so that um, uh, you can't then say it's irrational. I see this. Let me, I'll give you an example. We had the first Austrian oh, please. Sir. I was just going to say, maybe the distinction that is that you want to describe a good as a physical object. That's the only way an objective observer can describe it. That's the only way the observer comments mm -hmm. could appreciate it. Ice cream is what is in this thing. While Austrian would say, you are observing the entire, all characteristics of it, all benefits of it possible, in other words, which well, yeah. is only something you can observe or something that no one comments. Well, it depends on the individual. See, in most cases, Mill would be right. In most cases, I mean, empirically. But it doesn't have to be. Let me give you an example. The first Austrian conference, the first modern Austrian conference outside of old Austria, the first one in modern time, was held in 1973 at a wild place. 1974. I think it was 74. Summer of 1974. A crazy place called Royalton College of Vermont. Okay? It's in southeastern Vermont. It's a place which is more or less of the uh, income and, and uh, uh, standard of living of, the 19th, of 1850. Place of decaying, it's got, no, it's got nothing. It's got no, it's got no supermarkets. It's got no movies. It's sort of like a, a slice out of the, of the, of the ha happily forgotten past. The college was a fake college. It was a weird town. It was a town. It was a college by an entrepreneur. who was essentially a crook. <laughs> so it was a fake college. They had a fake law school and a fake hotel. Anyway, it's a hilarious thing. We sometimes go into the anecdotes of this, this ambiance. So one of the things was that they had there were two grocery stores. It was a teeny town with a population of uh, 400. It's like a Potemkin village. You saw there's a big village green or common, and houses on the outside, and then nothing else beyond it. So like a so like a Potemkin village or a movie. You have these fake houses, push them and fall in. <laughs> Nobody ever saw anybody in town. Never saw a soul in that town ever. At any rate, there were two grocery stores <coughs> right across the street from each other, like ten feet. 
And we observed that the prices in these were totally different. It's the same product. One store, I don't know, whatever, you know. Same cake of soap, charging, you know, 50 cents. The other store is 25 or something. So this is, you know, you're getting mind blown here. What the hell is going on? We're supposed to be economists. How do we analyze this? So somebody found a, we finally found one of the villagers there. And so how come this is going on? How come Zeke's store over here is charging different prices than Jake's? So a lot of the things in this town, there are two groups of people. Everybody, there's two groups of people in the town. Each group hates each other's guts. One group, one group only goes to Zeke's, the other only goes to Jake's, and none of them will cross-compete. There are no marginal buyers who ship from one or the other. It's a non-competing <laughs> grocery store. Well, so that happens. I mean, it's a little nutty, but I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's part of life. So usually, the prices of the soul will be the same. Okay? And this peculiar situation where everybody's got values where Zeke's, I, have to, I must go to Zeke's, we're going to Zeke's is somehow more important than the actual price of the product, then the prices differ. So that's what happens. And generally, it's true, <coughs> the price of the same thing will be the same. 